your following message from Redbud Baptist Church. Redbud Baptist Church is located at 801 Slide Road in Lubbock, Texas. We have two worship services on Sunday, 9 a.m. worship traditional, which is called Traditions, and then a more modern worship at 11 11 a.m., which you like to call Bridge. Join us anytime. We're a growing church, growing disciples. Enjoy the message. That's what come for. Amen. Thank you. Praise team. I appreciate that so much. Let me ask you a question this morning. If I were to ask you today, what one or two things in your life right now are a distraction? What, what is a distraction to you? You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? What takes you away from the things that you should be focusing on? What is it that pulls you, tugs you, moves you in the direction that maybe you shouldn't go or live in a way that you shouldn't live or do the things that you know you shouldn't do. What, what, what tugs at your heart? What is a distraction? Whatever that is, I want to give you some, some answers, some solutions for how to overcome that. How do you overcome those distractions? Several weeks ago, I was in my normal Bible study and just kind of Thinking about things that are going on in our society, things that are going on in the world, things that are happening here locally, and things that are happening in our church, both good and bad, and struggles and challenges, and all those things. I was thinking about all those things, and I was trying to figure out how do I, how do, how do I, how do we address these issues? How do we face, how do I teach my church to face the things that we are hearing and seeing and things that are happening in our society? How do I do that as a pastor? in our society. And I said, you know, Lord, what do I do? And it's just like a, just, just I, I can't tell you I heard a voice or anything like that, but just, just uh, this is what I felt God telling me. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Now, at first, like maybe some of you just now, you thought, well, pastor, we know that we, that's like, that's the given that we, we know that. And I do too. I do too. I, I, I know that's what we're supposed to do. But you know, there were some of those things that were distracting me from what I'm supposed to do, and that is to focus on Jesus. And maybe that's your case. So I want to read to you a passage of Scripture. The title of the message today is very simple, Fix Your Eyes on Jesus. And so I want to take you to a passage of Scripture in the, Old, in the New Testament, and it's a group of Christians that were facing kind of the similar situation. They were being distracted, they were struggling, and they were, they were in a fierce battle for what they were supposed to do. And God, by His grace, sends a letter. We don't know who the writer of the letter is, but we know that whoever it was, He understood these Christians and wrote them a message. And that letter is called uh, the letter to the Hebrews. And it's way back in the, in the New Testament. I'm going to read out of chapter 12. So I'm going to invite you to stand with me just one more time as we read. We're going to read two verses, uh, and then we'll pray and get into to the message today. In Hebrews chapter 12, the writer tells this, these group of Christians these words. Therefore, we also... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you, Lord, for this word. I pray now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come. And Father, if there are any among us today or watching online as we gather here today who are distracted or feel like they are distracted, like they are being pulled in so many ways, I pray, Lord, that today your Holy Spirit would help them to set aside, to lay down all of that weight and any sin that so easily ensnares them. I pray, God, that you give them victory over those things and you show them how life can be so much simpler 
if we just focus on Jesus. Lord, I pray that you help us to do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to read you uh, an old hymn. Many of you might remember the words. Some of you may not. Um, for those of you who remember the hymn, the melody will probably play, be playing out in your head and in your heart. But listen carefully to these words. That's what it says. O oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see? There's light for a look at the Savior and in life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fa fail you, he promised. Believe him, and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. For those of you who know the hymn, you probably played the melody in your heart as you were listening to it, but it's a, it's a telling hymn. It's an interesting story. It's a, it's a wonderful story written by um, a lady who was uh, going through her own struggle uh, at the time. There are things in our lives that distract us. And if you're distracted today, let me show you what the writer of Hebrews tells this group of Christians. From what we know, the, the people who are the recipients of the letter are, are Jewish. They're Jewish Christians in a Gentile world. By that, we mean that the Roman Empire was in control. Uh, and so there was, there was obvious animosity between uh, the, the Roman world, uh, the Gentiles that we read in the Bible, and the Jewish people. And so uh, when these Christians, when these Jewish Christians, or when these people became Christians, one of the things that happened was that after a while they were scattered all over the known world at the time. And so many of them had to leave if you read the book of Acts, many of them had to leave Jerusalem kind of in a very quick dash because of the persecution. And so these Christians here are being persecuted for their faith, for what they believe in. They were being persecuted by the people outside their, the, their church, the believers, the Christians. But they were also being persecuted by people inside or their, their Jewish comrades, they were being persecuted because they, the, these Jewish people kept saying to the, these Christians, they say, look, it's okay, you found Jesus, we're happy for you, great, but you still need to practice all these other things. And so there was teachers going around to these Christian churches and telling them, look, you've got to practice this, you've got to do this, you've got to live like this, you've got to do these things. And so they were often persecuted and they were in a, in a jam, if you will. And so that's these Christians, that's these people right here. They were being persecuted. They were struggling. And so the writer says, okay, you're being pulled in different ways. You're being tugged by different things. And so the solution to that, he said, is to focus your eyes on Jesus, to look at him, not religion, not church, not denomination, not any of those things. Focus your eyes on Jesus. Now, listen to this very carefully. He says to them, he says, since we have this great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Now, I've preached it that way before, and you've heard people tell, when they preach this passage, they talk about, they, they, get, they say, Picture yourself in a, in a stadium of some, some sports stadium, and, and you're, in the, you're in the stadium there. You're on the field. You're, you're playing the game of life, and in that stadium is filled of all of these Christians or people that have gone on to be with God, and they're cheering you on. And you know what? That's, that's, kind of, that's kind of exciting. It's kind of noble to, to think that, but that's really not what he's talking about. When he says a cloud of witnesses, he's not saying that these Christians are standing up there 
in heaven in the clouds watching you live life um, at all. Here's what, he, here's what he means. In chapter 11, if you read the story, in chapter 11, the writer describes all of those people in the Old Testament who had believed God and followed him in spite of all the challenges that they faced. And so we call it the hall of faith because it's people like Abraham, uh, Jacob, Isaac, David, and all of these Christians or these people that we read about in the Old Testament, and, and they believed God. And so by faith, they trusted God and what he was telling them, even though they were struggling, even though they had their own struggles. So, so the writer of Hebrews tells these Christians, look, you have this written history of all of these people who have come before you, and guess what? All of them have faced the same struggles you're facing now. And all of them were different, and they came from different places and different backgrounds, and they all faced the same struggles you face. So if you, if you, if you want to look at something, if you want to focus your eyes on something, he says, first of all, you've got these cloud of witnesses, or as, as we might want to put it, you've got all of these examples. You've got all of these examples that can, that can point you in the right direction. And then he says to them, he says, so because you have that, he says, you need to lay aside every weight, every weight. So what is a weight? What, when he says lay aside every weight, what does he mean by that? A weight is not necessarily a bad thing or a sinful thing. It could be, but it's not necessarily that. It's something that drags you down. So I want to ask all of us in here right now, right now, just think about this. When you get home after a busy day, wherever you've been, and you sit down, other than just physically tired, what would you describe as a weight, a heavy load that you carry? Maybe you're the only one that carries it, but you carry that load. And when you think about it, when you dwell on it, it just drags you down and it saps you of your energy. And it takes you to places that you don't want to go. For some of us, sometimes it takes us to dark places, awful places, horrible things that come into our head because of the weight that you are carrying. Well, first of all, I can tell you from my personal experience that I've been there. And, and there are people in this room that have been there as well. They, they've been there. And, and some of them maybe are still there, but they've learned how to deal with the weight. And so that, that's a weight, and it, and it drags you down, and it defeats you. And every now and then, you get a handle on it, and you do fine for a while, but it still takes you down. And the writer of Hebrews says, that's a weight. That's, let me put it another way, that's a baggage that you need to lay aside. And the word lay aside means something that you need, here's what he means, he says, you need to dump it. Di di dispose of it get rid of it and you say pastor that's not easy i know that's why he's saying focus your eyes on jesus so he says dump these things now look listen he says dump them leave it lay it aside drop it stop carrying it you and i are asked to do that Somebody might say, well, is that the same thing as let it go? Yeah, let it go. Listen, let me ask you something. Whatever that weight is, how much have you accomplished by carrying that weight? How far have you gotten carrying that load? What difference has it made? If, if I were a betting man and I'm not, and looking back at my own weights, I can tell you, that you really haven't made a lot of progress and you really haven't gone any further in life if, if you would just deposit it and leave it. He says, drop all of that. Don't carry it. It's not yours to carry. It's not your curse in life. It's not your punishment. Whatever, whatever we may think that it is, it's none of those things. 
He says, drop them. And then he says, not only the weights, but he says, and the sin that so ensnares us. Now he's talking about sin. And he's not, he's not pointing out specific sins in them. Here's what he's talking about. He's saying, look, we are all born sinners. We're all born that way. But when we came to Christ, when we came to Jesus Christ, we, we died to the old person. The Bible says that, that we, we die to the old self and a new person comes. In fact, Paul writes to the Corinthians and tells them, you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. But because you're still in this flesh, this body, we're still in, on this earth, we're still tugged at by all of these things that God says that we need to avoid. Just because we need to live away from these things doesn't mean that it doesn't tug at us. It doesn't mean that it pulls, doesn't pull on us. It still does that. It still does all those things. And he says, you need to lay those things aside. You need to put things aside. How do you do that? How do you do that? Because some of these things that we carry sometimes are very difficult. Well, the writer tells them, how, here's how he tells them to do it. He says, look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The word look there is a word that means to gaze at. Or another word would be to stare at. Now, I know what your mama told you. Don't be staring at people, right? Like my mama, she said, don't be staring at people because they don't like that. You know what Jesus says? I want you to stare at me. I want you to look at me. He wants you to look at him. Did you hear what the song said? The hymn it says, if you focus your eyes on Jesus, all of the distractions of the world just fall by their side. You know why? Because all of a sudden, all of those things, whatever weight you're carrying, whatever sin ensnares you, all of those things in the, in the sight of Jesus Christ all of a sudden become very insignificant. And I'll, and I'll show you why. So he says, lay him aside and fix your eyes on Jesus. And then he says about Jesus, he says, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. How in the world can you enjoy something? How can you have joy for something knowing that you're going to a cross? How can you have joy knowing you're going to a cross? What Jesus did, he was joyful he had joy because he was doing and being obedient to the Father and achieving that which God sent him to do. But notice something else. He says, despising the shame. He despised the shame. Look, when Jesus went to the cross, do you remember all those multitudes of people that followed him? He gave them fish and bread and did a whole lot of miracles and did all, he helped them a lot. When he was being tried, that same crowd turned on him. Turned, his, turned their back on Jesus, and they became, they became a group of people that hated him and rejected him. Now, I don't know about you, but it's kind of shameful when people laugh at you, when people make fun of you, when people do all of these things. It's, it's shameful. You know what Jesus did with all of that? He loved them so much that he took all of that shame and despised it. In other words, he did not give it the attention that it needed. He rejected it. He set it aside for the goal of achieving what God the Father sent him to do. And he says, you need to do the same. So how do you do that? Well, let me give you some, let me give you some ideas. Let me give you some, let me plant in your, in your heart some ways. So up here on the stage, you see some banners. You see a cross. You see a little wooden cradle. Let me, let me point those things out to you. Here's, here's where you can start. Here's what you can do. That banner there to my right says, a Savior is born. A Savior is born. Let me give you a thought. Why don't you go back to the New Testament. Go back to the Bible. Just pick up a Bible, the one that you can read most comfortable. Pick that up. Go to Matthew. Go to Luke. Go to John. And start reading the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, go to the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament and read what the prophet preached about Jesus long before Jesus ever came. 
and start connecting the dots. By the way, the dots are easily connected. What I'm trying to say is that it all meshes and makes sense. It all falls into place exactly like God said it it would. So go and, and read about a Savior is born. Because when Jesus came, that's why he came. He came to save that which was lost. Do you remember when Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost? Jesus did that. He was born. A Savior is born. Well, maybe, how about this one? The Lord is come. You say, well, what is is so significant about that? Well, the Bible says that Jesus' name is Emmanuel, the God with us. When Jesus was born, think about this. This is a hard concept, but it's true. When Jesus was born, it was God in human form who came to be born. God himself came to redeem you. Think about that. A Savior is born. The Lord has come. Well, what about, what about that wooden cradle there? It's just a piece of wood. But it's a simple piece of wood. There's nothing fancy about it. And when Jesus came, when the Savior was born, when God came, Emmanuel, God with us, when he came, he came to this little bitty town called Bethlehem, nobody knows about. And then he was born in a manger. Not a hotel, not a hospital, not any of those things. He was born in a manger. He, he just came, as you and I might describe it, in a very humble place. And that's where he was born. He didn't do a lot to attract attention to himself. No wonder the writer of the the song says, what child is this? What an amazing child. What What a unique thing. Do you know of anybody else that was born like Jesus and the kind of story that is made of Jesus? I don't know of anybody. And thousands of people have been born over time. What about... What about worship Christ, the newborn king? Do you remember when the wise men came looking for Jesus and they said to Herod, they said, hey, can you tell us where that new king is born? How did they know he was a king? That's interesting. How did they know he was a king? But they requested to see the king and the actual king said, wait a minute, what king? And he says, bring those people over here that know about this king. And and he he inquired as to when and where this king had been born. And he said, so that I can worship him too. That wasn't his goal, but he was trying to trick them. But wise men from the east and others knew that a king was born. Maybe today you need to read about a king. Start there, the king, the Lord Jesus I was listening to, I think, I don't know if he was a basketball, I don't know if he was a a player or a coach. He was being interviewed. And the reporter asked him about the, uh, his team played in England. uh, And I don't know if they won or not, but they were interviewing him. And the reporter asked him, he says, how did it feel like, or did you get any interaction with the royal family? And he looked at her and he said, do you mean... Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. And she kind of chuckled and didn't know what to say. And he said, I only know one royal family. And that's Mary, Joseph, and their son, Jesus, who is a king. I don't know about you, but that's really the right perspective. There may be kings on earth, but there's only one king. There's only one Lord of Lords, and that's Jesus. Maybe you need to Maybe you need to start in the Bible where it talks about him being a king. Or maybe you need to go to joy to the world. That's why he came, to bring joy to the world. Listen to what it says. He says, look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. Again, let me ask you, how in the world can you be joyful knowing you're going to a cross to die? Unless you know something else that others don't know. 
Maybe you here today need to look past these banners, look past this manger, and look to that wooden cross. Because it's at the cross where I said earlier, he paid the price. He paid for all the sin. He covered it all. He paid the debt in full. He took upon himself the wrath of God. He suffered everything that I should have suffered on the cross. He did that. Fix your eyes on a Savior is born. Fix your eyes on the Lord has come. Or a humble manger or the king, or joy to the world, or a cross. Fix your eyes. All of that points to Jesus. Here's what's going to happen. When you, point, when you fix your eyes on Jesus, when you take this book, I know a lot of people make fun of it these days, and most, a lot of people don't believe in it, but when you take this book and read it, read it for yourself, and ask yourself the hard questions. As a matter of fact, ask the book the hard questions. Ask God the hard questions. I promise you he's going to give you an answer. What's the answer going to be? What's God the Father going to say to you? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. How do I know that he's going to tell you that? Well, because the book of Hebrews tells you that. That's why I told you the Bible will answer it for you. Listen to what God will tell you if you look to Jesus and you ask God, why Jesus? This is what God will tell you. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days, the days we're living in, in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And on and on and on he begins to write. In fact, the whole book of Hebrews is about Jesus. The whole Bible is about Jesus. Today I want to encourage you. Whatever weight you're carrying, whatever struggle you have, why don't you consider Focusing on Jesus. Why don't you turn it over to him and see what he does? Like, like me and like other people in the, in the room, it's maybe you yourself. Some of us have tried a lot of things, right? We've tried a lot of things. None of it seems to last. Jesus will last. You want me to tell you Why? Because the Bible says that he is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. Everything, everything revolves around Jesus. I'm going to ask you to bow your head right there. And as our team comes up, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to pray for us. Maybe for some of you today, this morning, you need to start at the cross. If you were to be honest with yourself, you might say, well, Pastor, I don't know that I really know for sure. I don't know where I stand with God. Well, you can know. You can know. You say, how do, you, how do I do that, Pastor? Well, the Bible says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he came to die for you on the cross, that he paid the price in full and he resurrected on the third day, just like he said it. If you believe that in your heart and confess it with your mouth, here's what, here's what the Bible says, you shall be saved. End of story. Done. Complete. Finished. And all you have to do is tell that to God. If that's you, let me lead you in that. Whether you're watching online or whether here, Would you pray this to God? Would you say, Heavenly Father? Just say that to Him. Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. 
I believe in my heart that Jesus died for me. I believe that he paid the price in full. I believe that he resurrected on the third day, just like he said he would. I believe that. And Heavenly Father, I confess that to you right now. There's nothing fancy about those words, but if you meant them with all of your heart and you said them to God our Heavenly Father, then the Bible says that you are saved. You have trusted Him, you believed in Him, you repented of your sin, you asked Him to forgive you. He'll do that. Father, I pray for all of us in this room right now. I know that we're celebrating Christmas. I know that we're all excited. I know that we're planning on giving gifts and maybe not getting gifts, but just being around family, just doing the great things that we love to do during this season. But Father, I pray for every person in this room and every person who is watching online. And Father, if there's anyone here who's prayed to receive Jesus Christ, to say yes to Jesus, and to walk away from all of the weight and all of the sin, Father, I pray that you help them to take the next step. I pray, Lord, that you give them the strength, the will to do that. I pray, Lord, that they even would despise the shame just like Jesus. Lord, help them to understand it doesn't matter what people say. It only matters what you say. So I pray that you give them that will and that desire. Lord, there are some of us in here. We're Christians. We're saved. We know it. We, we, we live that life. But for some reason, maybe the, the, the zeal in our life, in our Christian walk, has kind of vanished. It hadn't been there in quite a while. Lord, I pray that you restore that. I pray that today you would help them to make the decision to say, you know what, I need to pick up where I left off. I need to move on. I need to grow. I need to learn. And I pray, Father, that you help them to do that, whether it's here at Redbud or wherever they may be, a part of a church. And if they're not one, Lord, lead them to one, that they might grow. And some of us, Lord, need to keep doing what we're doing, being faithful, sharing with others, talking to people about Jesus Christ, continuing to do the things that we know to do. I'm going to invite you to stand. And I'm going to ask you to do this. As we sing this song, you can do a couple of things. If you prayed that prayer, or if you need prayer, or if you need to talk to somebody, there's a couple of ways, or three things that we can, you can do. One, you can come and I can pray with you right here in the altar. We'll do that. Love to do that. There's a card in front in your pew. Take that card, fill it out, put your name on it, give us an email, a phone number, however you want us to reach out to you. Turn it to the back and say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. I prayed that prayer. What do I do next? That's all you got to do. Pastor, I prayed that prayer. What do I do next? If you're online or if you're here and you'd rather do it through a text, just text LIFE to that number right there and say the same things, do the same things, and we'll be glad to reach out to you. I'm going to come down here, and if anybody wants prayer, if you want somebody to talk with, I'll be here for just a second, Shane. <laughs>